All right, everybody. So welcome back to another Bike James podcast. This is James Wilson with MTB Strength Training Systems, and I've got a repeat guest. Uh, Brian McLaughlin is on today, and Brian is the Director of Medical Training at Mount Man Medical, and so I'm really excited to get him back on to get his uh, expertise on a subject that I think that doesn't get discussed enough in mountain biking, that is how to be more prepared for an emergency situation. So Brian, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be here. Awesome, man. So, uh, so for uh, we did an, a a podcast before. Uh, it was several months ago. I got a lot of great feedback on that one, um, and so I'm excited to get you back on. We went over some just kind of general concepts of like, hey, to be better prepared for a medical emergency in the wilderness specifically, because we're talking about mountain bikers. You know, we get away from civilization. And so, uh, you know, so we talked about some of that stuff, but for people, so I definitely encourage people, if you didn't listen to that one yet, go back and listen to that one. Cause there's a lot of great information there, but for people that didn't listen to that one, why don't we start out with, you know, who, who you are, how'd you get to where you're at? And, uh, and, and we can kind of, uh, uh go from there. So yeah, man, what is, what's the origin story for, for Brian McLaughlin? Ah, oh man, the origin story, man, I'm, I'm gonna have to lay it on thick now. Uh, so uh, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I am the director of medical training at Mountain Man Medical. I'm also the subject matter expert there. So I'm the person that uh, designs the kits and I do the talking for Mountain Man Medical. So uh, I go, I have a YouTube channel where I talk a little bit more about uh, this kind of stuff. And also uh, we travel around and teach classes uh, now and then uh, all over the country. And uh, it's been a pretty good gig. I got uh, my teeth cut on trauma medicine uh, but as a Boy Scout, my dad was a firefighter, a uh, career firefighter. So I went on some calls with him as a kid, got to see him do some stuff. And that kind of set me up strong for being able to handle emergencies. You know, he was great in an emergency, just always knew what to do. So I had that good representation. And I carried that on to uh, the military where I spent some time as a corpsman uh, stationed with the Marine Corps and uh, went to Afghanistan and uh, had a uh, very kinetic um, pretty hot deployment. I saw a lot of stuff, learned a lot of stuff. I really enjoyed my time and I learned a lot about myself and the world. <clears throat> Had And I uh, came back and started up Mountain Man Medical and it's, we've been cooking. It's been, uh, it's been good. Nice, man. Yeah, that's a uh, um, couple things there. One, I think just uh, last time we talked, you didn't, I, I didn't get the part about your dad being a fireman and you getting a chance to uh, see him work. And I think that that that's, you know, one really cool uh, in general, but it also speaks to like how important it is to, to model b behavior for your kids. So like, if you want your kids to be able to, you know, handle uh, a, an emergency situation, you being able to handle an emergency situation and modeling that I think is, uh, um, is, is super important. So I think you were, you know, lucky with having that, um, you know, is, is part of your upbringing there. And I, yeah, yeah. And also the um the the trauma medicine side and so we again discussed last time how I actually learned who you were and and became familiar with Mountain Med Mountain Man Medical more through the the trauma um you know uh self uh, per, you know self defense side of things because I started getting more into uh handguns and and getting my concealed carry permit and trying to expand you know, I've been in jujitsu for for 10 years but you start to understand when you really analyze violence, that jujitsu is a great base, but it's not the only answer. Hmm. And there are problems that may present themselves that require tools besides just uh, your hands. And so uh, understanding what those are and how to use those, but you also start to realize like, hey, it, there's more I, There's more that I don't know, right? Like I started to get into that and, I, and, and then I realized like, well, there's this whole medical side that I never even realized was there. And, and then I started to realize like, Hey, the principles behind the, the tactical medicine that they teach in, uh, in, in self-defense cases would have a direct application to mountain biking because the same principles apply, whether you're trying to, to patch someone up who's suffered a gunshot wound or a stab wound or, or something like that, or you're trying to help somebody who's punctured themselves on something on the trail or, you know, ha had the same kind of injuries that you might encounter. And so, um, so anyway, so, you know, for people who might be wondering, well, what is the, the crossover here 
that that is the crossover. Like the principles that uh, are the same. And, and I think that there's um, a lot of good stuff we can learn. And you guys got a lot of great resources on Mountain Man Medical. You guys have like an amazing free course on the March algorithm. I think maybe if you want to um, just kind of talk about that a little bit about that resource and just, you know, what is the March algorithm and, and how does it apply to, uh, you know, an emergency situation? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I like, first I, I wanted to say something a little bit on, I, I really like your approach on your training. You know, uh, you started off with jujitsu and then you realized, you know, I'm sure you felt very confident for a number of years. I can handle myself until you started to understand violence a little bit better. And you realized you had shortcomings in your game. You know, I think a lot of times you see in the gun community, the opposite, right? Um, a lot of times guys rely on their guns way too much and don't mm -hmm. do jujitsu. You know, I think that is something that I've been um, focusing on in my own personal growth is the growth of a warrior. It's much more about uh, growing as a warrior in all fields. Combat is a big picture thing. You know, um, I'm sure you've heard that phrase. It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in war. You know, right. I think, you know, um, I like to train so that if something does happen, I can respond to it. You know, um, I think medical is a big part of that. Um, you know, it's not enough to just know how to shoot and fight. You also need to know medical. I mean, that's why they teach all these high level medical or uh, military guys medical, because there's a good chance you're going to get hurt or you're going to be around people who are going to get hurt. I think mountain biking is very similar to that. You're going out and doing something risky. Um, it's dangerous to you and all the people that's around. That's why it's fun, right? Right. We accept that risk. We want that risk, but we also want to keep having fun, right? We want to keep doing these things that we enjoy. So we have to mitigate that risk. And a good way of doing that is by we reduce the chance of us dying if we have some medical gear on us that we can take care of ourselves if we happen to go down or somebody that we love goes down. So uh, the emergency trauma response course is completely online and it's totally free. Um, it was a big deal <clears throat> to me to not just sell trauma kits. I want people to know how to use them. You know, it doesn't do you any good to have this kit full of cool gear that you, you never actually tried to use before. Um, the time to learn is not in the emergency. So I wanted to come out with something free uh, that everybody could take. Uh, it's on our Mountain Man Medical uh, website. I get a lot of reviews on it. People love it. Uh, it's the first thing I've ever done on camera. So it's a little rough, but uh, the content is great. The content is really good. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's not that bad. To be honest with you, man, like I, I couldn't tell that that was your first time on camera. Oh, um, yeah, good. man. No. Yeah. For the quality that for what it is, man, is really is really good. I mean, for for a free course. I can tell that you guys put a lot of time and effort and thought about it. And so I, the reason I bring this up is because I think that that's a really good starting point for anyone listening to this. who's like, man, I really don't know anything about medical preparedness, medical emergencies. Like, well, what would I do if someone, either myself or someone that I was with on a ride got hurt? I mean, something that I explain to people is like, man, you may come across, you may be the first person to come across a car wreck. Right. Like like the odds of you being the first person to come across a car wreck where someone may need some some medical help are are, you know, I don't want to say they're high, but they're relatively high compared to like some other other things that people may prepare themselves for. or Like yeah. think about like needing to have preparation for. So, you know, even just having a trauma kit in your car, you know, because you're going to take it on the trail like there, there's all these 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 things that, that may happen. And so, like, what would you do? if you came across an emergency situation, I think that one of the, one of the worst feelings that you can have is standing there watching someone who's in trouble and you don't know what to do. You're just standing there helpless, looking around at everyone else. Like I, I tell this story, I had this, uh, this, this incident where I was on, I was starting my bike ride and there was a kid who fell off a probably like, you know, 20 foot, uh, ledge. He was, it, it was near the trailhead and he was kind of hiking around on it while his parents were getting ready to go ride. And he fell off of that thing and ended up like tumbling down and hitting his head. And it was, you know, a pretty traumatic situation, man. His mom's like screaming. Like I'd never heard a person scream like that before. It took me a second to realize it wasn't an animal. And I don't mean that in like a, like a derogatory way. Like there's just, 
there's a sound that a mother makes when she sees her child like potentially die that you're like, holy fuck. Yeah. And and I, you know, there was a moment where I was like, man, what do I do? Do I go back? Do I just keep riding? And I was like, man, I can't just ignore the situation. I, I got to go back. And I'm just like standing there and there's like, you know, I hadn't, this is before I got into any of this stuff. Again, I don't, I, I didn't know what the March algorithm was. I didn't have any equipment. I didn't have any training. I'm just standing around looking at everybody else who's standing around looking at everybody who's like, dude, we don't know what to do. And luckily I'd taken a first aid kit course before as a personal trainer, you, you, you know, you got to keep your first aid certification up. And so I, I asked, has anybody called the, the, uh, call for help. And they're like, yeah. And then I remembered that like, you want to have somebody go lead help in. Like if you're out in like a wilderness area or whatever, like they may not know exactly where the trailhead is. They may not know exactly where this is. So if you can get someone to go back to the main road and lead the ambulance in, lead the the medical people in mm -hmm. that that's super helpful. And so I, I remembered that and I was like, OK, I can do that. And I, I, I went back and luckily, sure enough, man, I could see the look in the ambulance driver's face like they had no idea where to go look. They knew where the trailhead like the trail system was, but there were multiple trailheads over miles of area. And I was like, hey, man, do you guys know where you're going? They're like, no. And I was like, follow me. And, you know, we jammed back to exactly where they were. And. You know, but the, the that moment of like, OK, I have something that I can contribute. I can help in some way, in some small way was a much different feeling than when I was standing there having not knowing anything to do. And so I, I just I, I encourage people like you don't want to be standing there with someone needing help and you not being able to maybe it's being handled already. Right. But you want to you want that because like somebody else is on it. You know, you could help if needed, not because you're standing there like, I don't know what to do. I got nothing. I got nothing to contribute here. Like, that's just a, a terrible feeling. So um, I know it's kind of a little bit of a, you know, side rant there. But I just I think it's important for people to think about like it is it's a terrible feeling if you are standing there and someone needs help and you don't know what to do. Yeah, definitely. I, I think <clears throat> I love talking to medics. And a lot of the things that I like to ask is like, why'd you get into this? You know, and a a big reason a lot of these medics do is because they someone that they loved or saw get hurt very badly and they were stuck there not knowing what to do and they hated mm. that feeling and they swore to themselves i'll never feel like that again then they become para paramedics and doctors and that kind of thing so that's a very common thing that happens the other thing that you think yeah you need to think about is um like how do you become good in an emergency the only ways to do that is to experience it you know, um, those guys that we see being studs running in there and taking care of the situation and handling it like a boss, they do that because they've done it a lot. You know, um, they're they're comfortable in the chaos. But that's kind of hard for us to get as civilians. Right. This is not our job. We're not doing this on the regular. So how do we compensate for that? First, we need to have a good mindset, understand where we are and how we're going to operate. Having lines in the sand is important. Rolling through scenarios in our mind, like what you did, you know, you're out on the trail, somebody goes down next to me, how am I going to handle this situation? Where am I going to get this ambulance into? How are we going to get this person out? By rolling through those scenarios in your mind, you're going to set yourself up for when it actually happens. You'll see yourself just immediately hop into the situation and take over and do everything right because you've already mentally prepared. On top of that, it'll help you, especially if you know what you're doing. Training is important. Trying to find a, a resources so you can take care of that is going to be, I mean, ideal. Yeah. No, yeah, for sure, man. I've once uh, heard, I forget exactly how I put it, but like, you know, it's, it's not enough to say that you're ready, right? Like you, you can be ready to help, but you also need the tools to help and the training, right? So like I say, like if somebody says I'm ready to go for a mountain bike ride and then you find out they don't own a mountain bike and they don't even know how to go for a ride right. or they don't even know how to ride a bike, right? Like they can want to ride a bike, go for a mountain bike ride all they want, but it's not going to happen. Or if they try it, it's going to be ugly. And it's the same thing. Like you can say like, oh yeah, I'd be ready to help in an emergency situation. But if you don't have the training, which part of it is, you know, courses like the ones that you guys offer, also the visualization aspect, because that's basically what you're talking about is visualizing yourself in these situations. And what would I do? How would I respond? And I talk a lot about visualization for helping people on the trail with riding technical features Excellent. and overcoming anxiety and, and, and stress and stuff like that. 
And it's the same thing there. You can use visualization in a, in a stressful situation. Like what would I do if I, you know, came across someone who needed help? How would I handle that? Um, and then also just, you know, practicing it as well. So like having, a, a you know, a, we'll get more into tourniquets here, I'm sure uh, here pretty soon, but like a tourniquet, for example, you know, you can either invest in a, a practice one or like, you know, it's better to have practiced with, with the one that you're going to use than it is to be like, oh, I don't want to like wear this thing out and never have practiced and used it before. And then when someone's bleeding out, you're trying to figure out exactly how to do this thing. But like all three levels, you know, uh, are important to make sure that you truly are ready to help in that emergency situation. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's, that's really good, really good advice there. I love that you talk about visualization because this is like, you know, that's, I love how interconnected things are, you know, cause that visualization is important in, in many areas of life. You know, I learned that visualization tool in combat as a way of keeping myself present and preparing for the next emergency. And that was in a very, very stressful environment. And I've used that. I was fortunate to learn that kind of young in my life. And now I've applied that to pretty much all aspects of my life to great success. Um, so visualization, if you're scared of something, imagine that thing that you're scared of. The worst thing that you don't want to deal with, walk yourself through it. Think, how am I going to handle this? If I was the best medic in the world, how am I going to handle this? But also, how's my face going to look? What's my tone of voice going to be like? You know, what are my mannerisms are going to be like? Um, that was really successful in kind of getting me into the right identity for being somebody who is going to respond quickly and appropriately to an emergency yeah no that's that's a good way of putting it like putting yourself in an identity you know because it really is it's a lot of head games and, and head tricks it is. you gotta play on yourself it works so good though right so the reason why i was able to figure that out is because i did i was not the best medic in, on the battlefield like i was shaky and i had no idea what was going on and overwhelmed and i had a chance to see some of the best medics out there just super calm run up on a casualty take care of them do everything right just hey brother i got you don't worry about it you know i'm here to take care of you you know and i was like you can do that like i thought you had to be freaked out all the time uh, but these guys weren't you know as i was like well, if they're doing it then maybe i could do that so when i would do my scenario and visualization i would think about myself looking like those guys you know i would assume that identity of the best doc on the battlefield and when the time came I was, it was crazy to how well it worked, but it is, it does. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Kind of same thing on the trail, man. You gotta that, like, cause I wasn't the best rider in the world. And that's why visualization was such an important part for me to, to progress my, my skills. Um, especially on like the, the higher consequence side of things where like, if you crash, like, yeah, things can go wrong and then go really wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, you don't, you can't freak out in those moments. About and, is no joke. Yeah, yeah, man. There's definitely I, I call them the I called it the the hell or high water moments, right? Like I still have them on the trail, but they're not the same, right? Like I'm 47. I just don't bounce the same way I used to. The risk to benefit <laughs> ratio is not the same with two kids and stuff. And so like I look back on like you know the 20 year old me and early 30s me, and I'm like, dude, that guy was a madman. I don't know what that dude was thinking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like to to you had to put yourself in that in that frame of mind and, and, and become that identity of like, I am the person who's able to ride this stuff and remain calm. And no matter what happens, I, you know, just remain calm and, and just respond in the moment um, sort of thing. And that's what, that's really like the ultimate flow that you're looking for. Like the ultimate life experience is like, you know, like, like we, we were talking about jujitsu and like, that's why I like jujitsu so much fun. Cause like when you're rolling and someone's trying to strangle you, like there's nothing else going on in the world. There's nothing else. There, there's nothing else that exists, but that, that one moment and trying to survive that one moment and then go to the next moment and then go to the next moment. And as soon as you let your mind start seizing up and it can't flow from moment to moment to moment, and you start thinking about, oh man, what about this? This person's watching me, right? Or, or, or like, I don't know, this person shouldn't be doing this to, or whatever, right? Like you get these, these weird thoughts and like, I'm sure the same thing probably in, in the medical side as well like you're you know once you you realize like oh i've got i'm thinking i have too many minds right i have too many too many thoughts going on as opposed to just responding to this moment and and then responding to the next moment and responding to the next moment 
and just flowing uh, through that. So like on some level, those are like the ultimate life experiences that we're all looking for which is why I think we put ourselves in these weird situations. Absolutely. So. How, how else do you know if you're alive, man? I think that's exactly right. I think it's a mixture of confidence and competence, right? I think uh, maybe in your younger years, you might think, you know, in your 20s and 30s, maybe you were not nearly as competent, but your confidence level was, boom, you know, through the roof. <laughs> and after a while of being bounced around a little bit, now you've got kind of a firmer grasp of actually what's going on. You know, and so now you're refining, you know, and your competence is is going up and your confidence is coming back down to a more manageable level for your overall yeah. enjoyment. You, know, you can't maintain that level of, you know, fuckery when you're uh, when you're 20 and 30. Right. You just can't maintain. No, it. no, no, man. There's old bikers and there's bold bikers, but there's no old, bold bikers. <laughs> uh, I've heard a lot of different. Yeah, I've been in a lot of communities. You hear something very similar to that. It's very similar, day. man. It's part of it. It's all part of it. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. So, all right, cool. So let's, uh, I uh, I think, like I said, we, we kind of started talking about the March algorithm a little bit. Let's just touch on that real quick so we can start with, like, what is the March algorithm? And I think that'll give some context when we start getting into the, the kit that I wanted to talk about. So I think it's a really good way for people who have no, you know, start with the course that they offer and then buy this kit. And you're going to be just light years ahead of most people for when it comes to being able to handle an emergency situation. So uh, so just kind of put it in context, like what is the March algorithm? If, you know, if you could just go over that and just kind of describe briefly each of the steps. And then, like I said, you guys go into it very specifically. You, you have a specific lesson for each step of this algorithm as part of your course. And so uh, people that want to like dig into, into more uh, can can take that course. But uh, I guess let's just start with kind of like the, like I said, the overview of that March algorithm. Yeah. Uh, so the March algorithm is, it's more of an acronym. I'm not really sure why they call it an algorithm, probably because it comes from the military and they don't know what they're doing, but it's a way for medics to kind of stay on task and remember a priority for what they should treat first. Um, there's a lot. So March M A R C H is the acronym. And each one of those letters, of course, stands for something. And uh, they have, there's been a couple of different variations of March. They have P March P and P March P plus and a bunch of other things. Um, I, I like to stick more to just March because I have a much smaller audience. Uh, these are just civilians who are interested in bleeding control primarily. So we're not doing too, too many other things. So M is first on your list. So this is how, when you're working on somebody, you think to yourself, March, what is M? M stands for massive bleeding. That's what you're going to take care of first because that's what's going to kill your patient the quickest. If they're bleeding out from an artery, then they're going to be dead if it's a femoral artery within two and a half to three, four minutes or so. So you don't have a lot of time, but you do have some time. You know, that's still time enough to get out a tourniquet and to get that applied. If you don't have a tourniquet, your best method of bleeding control is going to be direct pressure. You just want to get pressure on top and right over top of that wound. And then you just have to hold it until EMS can show up with the tourniquet. That's why it's great to have your own on you. But if you don't have one, a lot of lives have been saved with just direct pressure. Where's the bleeding coming from? Push down really hard and try to get that bleeding to stop. And the problem is you're just going to be stuck there for a while until somebody can get there or make a tourniquet for you. So um, a big thing that you're gonna have to think about is being in a removed location here. So if you don't have medical gear on you, you might need to make your own. Making your own medical gear takes time, time that your casualty is bleeding out. So um, it's an important skill to have because you might need to do that. You might run out of medical gear and in this situation, you might need to know how to make one, but we wanna avoid that if at all possible. Uh, a purpose-made tourniquet is gonna control bleeding much, much better than one you made out of a magazine and a, uh, and a and a towel, right? So we want to have this medical gear on us as all as possible. M stands for massive bleeding. That's our first one. <laughs> then it goes into airway. If we can open up the airway and make it easier for them to breathe, we want to make that happen. If they come off of a mountain bike and smash their face up on a rock, they might have difficulty breathing. And we want to make sure that we're managing that appropriately. Something you might want to do is if they're unconscious and they're not able to keep their airway open, 
and their face is smashed up from that rock, you might want to roll them over on to a side so that all that blood and everything can drain away from their face so that they're not aspirating on it. So A is for airway. Um, this might be a place where you can put in a nasal pharyngeal airway. Um, this is just a soft rubber tube that goes into the nose and back behind the tongue and helps to keep the airway open. Uh, we sell pre-lubricated ones on the Mountain Man Medical website, um, but they also have some out there that aren't lubricated and they're sold with a little packet. I also have a video on my YouTube channel of me putting one in one of my warehouse guys. He, uh, he volunteered, I said, hey, who, uh, who wants to let me put this, uh, uh, this nasal pharyngeal airway in? And John Paul's like, I'll do it. So got a video <laughs> of that on, uh, him doing that on our, our channel. So airway, want to protect the airway. Next comes respirations. And this is more assessing the chest for their ability to keep breathing. This is where if there was penetrating trauma to the chest, like a gunshot wound or maybe a stick, um, they come off their, their mountain bike and hit a stick or something like that, and they've got a hole in their chest, we wanna make sure that we're taking care of that. Um, chest seals are a great way of doing that, um, but you can make an improvised chest seal pretty quickly if you have some tape and just a piece of plastic. Um, you just want something that won't let the air in and out. And as long as you tape down all the sides, they're going to be fine for the most part. That's a uh, great way of improvising an occlusive dressing. So R stands for respirations. Then we're going to go on to C, which is circulation. And this is going to be a head to toe search, top to bottom, to make sure we haven't missed anything important. Now, pretty often you'll be working on somebody, think you've got this guy totally patched up and there'll be a sneaky little wound you missed and they're steadily bleeding out into the gravel, right? So we wanna make sure we do an assessment, head to toe, treat as we go. On top of that, we're gonna be checking any tourniquets, any wound packing, any chest seals, anything that we've done for this person, we're gonna check it to make sure it's still working. You never know if maybe you didn't apply it right or it's come loose or whatever the case is, we always double check. So when we get to C, that's where we're gonna recheck everything that we did from head to toe. Next is going to be H, and that stands for two things, technically head trauma and hypothermia. Head trauma is a hard one. There's not a lot that you can do for that. I'm sure you know that wearing your helmet does not protect you from concussions. It only protects you from fractures. So if you come off your bike and you hit your head on the ground, you're going to have a, a bad concussion. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting that person seen in the ER so they can get them checked out. Um, don't let people just walk that stuff off. I've seen people die that way. You get a brain bleed and they, they just tough it out because they've fallen off their bike a thousand times. It's no big deal. I'm just going to have a headache and go home and sleep it off. And they wind up dying. So I recommend if you're at all worried that this person might be severely injured, we should get them seen at the ER. I've known a lot of people that have waited to, to go get seen at the ER or didn't tell their buddy that they should go. And because of that, you know, their friend is gone and they feel bad about that. They feel a lot of guilt. It's not their fault, but they still feel a lot of guilt about that. So I recommend just get them in. Um, so head trauma, we don't, we can't really do much for that. Um, as medics out there in the field, we can't really do anything if it's severe enough. Um, all we can really do is wait for transport. So get EMS rolling as quickly as possible. That should be our first step. Um, get someone going for help or on a cell phone or on a sat phone or whatever you've got out there on the trail with you. Get, those, get that bird in the air or get EMS at least rolling to the scene. We need to get them there as quick as possible. So head trauma, there's not a lot we can do for that. Just get them transported. The next part of H is also hypothermia. If they've lost a lot of blood, there is a good chance they become hypothermic. Your blood is responsible for regulating your temperature in your body. If you don't have a lot of blood, your body's not able to regulate the temperature and you could drop below um, unsafe levels of body temperature. So anytime you've got somebody who's been hurt in the field, we want to monitor them and keep them nice and warm. Even on a nice, warm, sunny day in Colorado, you're out on the trail, you still need to keep your casually warm. They can still expire. So we want to make sure we get them into the cab of a truck pile on some coats or blankets. Um, I like to have um, one of the things in my trauma kit is a space blanket so that I can just put that on. It's not the best. It's not going to do a, a great thing for them, but it's better than nothing. Um, and that'll help out a little bit until you can get them a little warmer. So from the top, 
March stands for massive hemorrhage, M. A is airway. R is respirations. C, circulation. H, hypothermia and head trauma. Awesome, man. Yeah, that was uh, a, a great overview of those different steps. And again, the the idea is to give you a checklist. Okay, what is first? What is second? Because uh, you know, you may run up on someone and they've got like their shin bone sticking out, like they broke their leg and it's, it, it looks terrible. It's like, holy shit, this is the gnarliest wound they have. And meanwhile, they've got a cut that is, you know, bleeding pretty good. Like maybe not like a femoral or like an arterial, uh, hit where it's like, obviously like I, you know, you know, you, you guys demonstrated, I remember you guys dumping the red liquid as part of your course. Like this is, you know, this much blood and this is this much blood. And it's like, dude, if someone's bleeding out, like it can be pretty dramatic uh, how quickly the blood can start to to pour out and pool. Um, but you you don't want to leave it to be like, what is the most dramatic looking thing that's calling my attention? And then I'm going to address that first, right? It's like, okay, yes, that leg looks terrible, but it's not bleeding profusely. Uh, let's check them for, for, you know, uh, major bleeding, major hemorrhaging. And then you're like, oh, there's a, a bad, uh, cut on the back of their leg or something. So that's, that's the way I've heard it described for, for the reason that, um, they've done this to help medics prioritize what is the first thing, because it may not be the gnarliest looking thing that's going to kill them. Uh, and you end up like focusing all your time and effort on this one thing and, and ignoring this other thing. The hypothermia was another one that I didn't realize, right? Like how the blood circulates and, and keeps you warm. And so even if it's warm outside, if someone's uh, been injured, especially if they've lost any amount of blood, you want to make sure you're keeping them covered and keeping them warm. Um, and again, like it just before I had a chance to uh, educate myself in this area, I didn't realize these things, right? So I would have run up and like treated the gnarliest looking thing, or I would have been like, hey, it's hot out here. Let's keep you cooled off. Uh, you know, because that might sound like a better idea, yeah. but having education in this area, especially from, you know, people who like things that have been developed to help people who do this for a living, um, on a consistent basis, like, like that's, a, a, a I think a, a, something that every rider should do because we are putting ourselves, you go out away from civilization. Like that's, uh, one of the cool things about riding is that you get to get out away from people and civilization but that's one of the downfalls if you get hurt, like it could be a while till help gets to you or if you, you know, may not have cell phone coverage and have to, you know, get out. And so it's the, these things that we don't talk about because it sounds like all we want to talk about is like how fun riding is. But I don't think we're doing anybody any favors by not also talking about, like, hey, here's how to be prepared. Right. And, and, the, and the basic things, basic thing to start with, even if you don't get any medical gear. Like go take that that course, learn what the March algorithm is, so you at least have some framework to work from if you do find yourself in a situation like that. So um, I think that's that's that was a really good, really good place to start overview for people. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's important to we we got to take care of ourselves because writing is fun, right? We want to keep writing, and we don't want to be so broken from an injury <clears throat> or potentially dead. Um, because, uh, you know, we didn't prepare for it ahead of time. And I think it's also important. It's good for you to have your own skills and to be able to take care of yourself. But if you're the one that goes down, you don't want to be the only one with the knowledge, you know, um, yeah. especially if you got a writing partner or a writing club, you know, going through this training so that everybody knows what's going on, I think is important. Um, you don't have to do this all the time for this information to really stick. You know, I think, um, you know, trauma medicine, it's, continually changing and you have to kind of stay updated on the new things that come out. Um, but primarily um, it's not difficult to do and it's not difficult to learn so that if, if you do it on, you know, maybe a quarterly or even a biannually basis like twice a year or something like that, then you, you would completely meet all your requirements um, for this kind of thing. It doesn't take a whole lot of time and effort to revisit it uh, to get it back going. Yeah. Nice, man. All right. Well, so let's get into the specifics, right? And so if people are like, well, okay, I'm, I'm interested. I want to start being better prepared. So, you know, I've got the training side, at least the start of it covered. I'm going to go take the free course at Mountain Man Medical. But now I need the tools, right? That's the other part of being prepared is, is having the tools to, um, to, to be able to help people. And so 
I was looking on you guys offer, uh, you guys have a lot of great products and, and a lot of uh, great kits basically that you have put together. So instead of somebody having to go there and be like, okay, I need to get a, a tourniquet and I need to get this and I need to get that. And, and they can certainly do that there, but you guys have gone in and like said, okay, well, here's a kit that has all of the, the, the things that we would have together. And so you can just get that. And the Sweetwater was uh, is a great one because you can get it for you know it's 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 technically under fifty dollars right it's forty nine dollars so it's not a, a big investment at all but you guys have an impressive amount of gear in it and gear that I think serves some uh, vital purposes so I, I wanted to have you go into like what is in the kit and you know why is why is the that piece important. And so that people can kind of understand, like, here's here's what you can get and here's why it's important to have. Um, but, yeah, I'll let you kind of kind of take it from there. And if I got any questions or whatever, I'll I'll jump in. But, um, but yeah, I thought that'd be a good thing to go over in this podcast. Yeah, no problem. I've got answers for that. So I designed all the kits. So it's all based on the things that I think are the most important. Um, I've had a lot of people review them, a lot of doctors and ER nurses and uh, SWAT medics and special forces and they all say that they love the kit, so I'm pretty sure it's going to be a good quality kit for you. It's all stuff that I know is going to work, right? Because I carry these for my family, right? So I want to make sure that it's going to work for me. Um, so first and foremost, we've got bleeding control. And bleeding control is going to be primarily done with a tourniquet for your arms and legs. So for that, we have the SWAT T tourniquet, which is stands for stretch, wrap, and tuck. And when, if you go to the website and you look at what that is in the picture, it's going to look like a uh, orange rubber band. Yep, right there. Yep, I got one on the, if you're watching this video, I've got one that I've, 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 uh, I've brought mine. Um, but yes, it's basically like a big orange rubber band. So uh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to no, show you. I, I brought mine to show you I'm a good boy. There we go. Good hey, job. there we go. <laughs> yeah. I love this product, right? Uh, it's really good because not only is it a tourniquet, um, and it's very small, lightweight, and easy to pack, but you can use this for a lot of other things as well. Um, you can tie it into a knot and turn it into a sling. Um, you can use it to tie on splints for arms and legs. If you're out there in the wilderness, you might have to do that with fractures. That's always a possibility. You could cut off a, a square of it, tape down all the sides, and now you got a chest seal. Um, you can use this as a pressure dressing to keep gauze in place. Maybe you have a really big wound and you're trying to pack it. You cut up a big strip of uh, t-shirt, pack that down in the wound, and you can keep it tied in place with this, at, using it as a pressure dressing. So it is a great multifunction item. Not only is it a tourniquet, but it fills the role of everything else in your bag as well. So if you need additional pressure dressings, you, you've got that uh, available to you. Uh, next is going to be uh, some wound packing material. So this is going to be gauze. Uh, this is just normal gauze in our sweet water. If you want to get an upgraded version, get the uh, Kaido gauze or quick clot. Uh, it's a little more expensive, but it has a hemostatic agent in it. And hemostatic means that it makes the blood clot quicker. Um, these are great products to have. I highly recommend it. They're a little spendier though. So if your budget, it doesn't really allow then go ahead and just use the normal gauze. That will still be very, very effective at controlling bleeding. That hemostatic agent is good, it's beneficial, so we'll use that if we have it on hand, but primarily what we're looking for here for bleeding control is that wound packing. You're pushing so much of that gauze down into the wound, it's pushing down on the artery and, and getting it to clamp off. So that's where a majority of our bleeding control is coming from, not necessarily from the quick clot or the chido gauze hemostatic agent. So um, wound packing material is very important, but you also need to have a way to keep it in place, right? So you have to hold, if <clears throat> it's 10 minutes to hold uh, normal gauze to get a blood clot to, to form and three to five minutes for quick clot or chido gauze. So you need to hold direct pressure there and a pressure dressing is what you'll use to hold that so you don't have to keep your hands in place the whole time. This is going to drive pressure down onto the wound and keep that gauze nice and in place and free you up to go do other things, take care of other wounds or whatever you need to. So um, making sure that you've got the pressure dressing is important. Ours is North American Rescue um, and uh, uh, the ETD, uh, Emergency Trauma Dressing. And so very high quality product. Next is going yeah. to be... 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I just I wanted to uh, um, just mention that, like when you say like high quality product, I, I think it's important to uh, remind people that like you can go on Amazon and find this stuff potentially cheaper, but you are buying knockoffs that uh, don't work nearly as well. And you are, you know, putting your life in the hands of inferior gear. So I think that's one thing I wanted to point out uh, is that you guys have personally sourced all of the, the stuff that you carry and the things that you put in these kits to be high quality gear that is actually going to work in an emergency situation. So just like I said, you may be able to find something cheaper on Amazon, but I wouldn't trust my life to that crap. And so I think it's important to, to point that out. I appreciate that. And I agree, which is why it's important for me to put out a good product. We have a price match guarantee. You can find any of our gear for cheaper somewhere else. We'll match that price. No one has ever taken us up on it. We have the least expensive trauma kits on the market with the best quality of gear in it. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I try to put stuff in it like that, the North American Rescue. It's stuff that I've used. I know it's going to work. It's top of the line. So I, I think it's important to put that out there. We've got two pairs of gloves in there. Cause if you're working on somebody in, on the trail, you've got one pair for yourself and another pair to hand off to a bystander if you need to. Uh, although I like to have at least two pairs in every one of my kits. Cause there's a lot of times I've run up onto a scene, you get into a hurry and you just rip through your pair of gloves and now you're like, ah, now what? Right. So at least you got a backup pair for that. Um, mm -hmm. Some trauma shears um, to open up the, the clothes. You got to get a look at what's going on. Um, so that you're taking care of it appropriately. I, I've known a lot of people that think that they've fixed the wound. They apply a tourniquet. They see blood on the leg. They apply the tourniquet high and tight, and then they just wait for help to show up. Turns out the wound is higher than that tourniquet. And if they had just looked, they would have been able to see that what they really needed was wound packing and the tourniquet's not actually doing anything. So making sure we get eyes on that wound is very important. So trauma shears are one of those great items. Um, plus, it's a great multi-use item. You can use it for a lot of different things. Pretty much anything that you're going to encounter in an emergency trauma situation, you're probably going to need trauma shears for it anyway. So we always include a small pair, a micro pair. They're not huge, uh, but they will get the job done. Um, and then the last item that we have is going to be uh, a marker, a uh, permanent marker, so that you can make notes, um, detail your location, write the time on a tourniquet, or whatever else you might need that for. And that's all nice. Awesome. Yeah. 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 And if you go through, uh, again, the March, uh, the, 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 the acronym or algorithm, whatever we're going to call it, um, you, you can see like, okay, the each, each thing there. Now there's, there's an emphasis. I think one of the things that, um, there's definitely an emphasis on, and it's the most important thing for your average person is controlling bleeding, right? Like they've, they've got stop the bleed courses. I've taken those before. Like if, if you have the opportunity, cause taking a first aid course is great, but they do not go into the stopping the bleeding at the same level as like a, a stop the bleed course. And really that is the, the, you know, again, the, the most, the most important thing is the most important thing, right? But for most people, it's going to be controlling the bleeding because you want to make sure that the person who's hurt doesn't bleed out before help is able to get to them. Like, again, we're not trying to become EMTs or emergency room doctors or anything. We're just trying to stabilize the situation long enough <clears throat> for the real help to get there. Mm -hmm. And the, and the number one concern, the thing that's going to kill most people before help gets there is going to be bleeding out. And so, you, you know, you guys have uh, a lot of, of things to help control the bleeding. There's definitely an emphasis towards that, but you know, you're, you know, like you mentioned, you can use the trauma shears and the SWAT T tourniquet and cut a piece off and, and use that as a chest seal. So, you know, the, that you can, um, you know, there, so there's other, other things that you can do. And, you know, if you wanted to, uh, add some things like, so like a, a solar blanket or, you know, an emergency, uh, blanket would be something that would be not very expensive to add to that and would, would help with, um, you know, the, the H as far as like the, um, the hypothermia side of it. And so the, I think, you know, again, if you're, if you're looking at like, okay, from the March algorithm, this covers the most important aspects of that, especially the things that we can do, right? Like you said, like there's, there's only so much you can do in the field for, for certain types of injuries. And so the main thing that you can do is, is control bleeding 
uh, and and so you guys have definitely got um, quite a few things there to to help with that. So uh, and it, you you mentioned the quick clot, the or, you know the hemostatic dressing. You know that's a was something I had a note that people might consider um, adding or, or upgrading to, but you already covered that. But it's it's one of those like you don't want to not you're like, okay, hemostatic dressing is best. And then, but you can't afford it yet. And so you don't get anything. And like, that's not the idea. Like you said, like, like get some sort of gauze in your kit. And, and so you guys have a great option for that, but like, don't get hung up on what's best. I think that was one of the things with the tourniquet, right? Like you, you really, you really turned me onto this thing and, and changed my opinion of it. Because the thing is, is if you were to, I guess, I, I think I even heard, uh, um, you know, Jacob, uh, one of the, the, cause you guys have a, a you know, there's, there's several companies that are involved together, Mountain Men Medical, and, and they all cover like really great sh stuff. And the guy at the head, Jacob, um, I had a chance to meet you guys at, uh, at, at one of the events at, at, a, at the local shooting range. So you guys are all great guys, but I listened to several of the, the different podcasts and he, the way that he described it was like, you know, okay, if I had a, a table in front of me and they had all the different tourniquets sitting there, and someone, and I needed to control bleeding, I probably wouldn't reach for the SWAT T tourniquet first. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's not effective. Right. And, and that, and, and then when you also consider that like, okay, the best tourniquet for me is the one that I'm going to carry. So like, you can literally, like I walk around with this thing in my back pocket right. during, you know, I, like I, I, I'll carry, I have a pack that I have like a, a more, you know, kitted out medical kit the, you know, little shoulder sling bag that I'll carry around. If anybody ever sees me carrying that thing, that's what I have in there. Um, but sometimes I don't want to carry that, you know, I'm just going in the store real quick, but I always want a tourniquet. I always want something on me. So I have this thing just, it's in my back pocket. It's very easy to carry. This doesn't take up much space at all in a bag. Um, so again, if you're like, okay, well, I've done research and I found that the number one tourniquet is the, you know, this tourniquet here. And I'm going to, but I can't, I'm not going to put that in my pocket. I'm not going to carry it on me. I'm not going to put it in my bag because it takes up too much room. It's too expensive. Any of these excuses. And it's like, man, you're better off just getting the, the SWAT T tournament because it is effective. Right. And then, and then, and the fact that you can use it for so many other things um, is a, uh, I, I think really makes it a, a must have, even if you have another tourniquet in your kit, I, I still will have this as a, you know, Hey, never hurt. That helps to, hurts to have two tourniquets and this thing covers so many other bases. It, it, it doubles up, um, you know, again, in the, the tactical community, something I I've heard a bunch that I, I like, you know, the, the two is one and one is none. Yep. Right. It's like, if you have one of something, man, you might have none of that, right. If that thing breaks or you lose it or you, you use it, right. Then you have none. And, but if you have two, if you have a backup for your stuff, then, well, now you've got two. And so now that is, you know, that may be one in, in whatever case. And so, you know, popping this thing into your emergency kit um, effectively doubles up quite a few things in that kit and, and makes it a, a more effective kit. Yeah, it's it's like it's its own uh, trauma kit in one little package. And if I'm going to the to a concert or something like that and I don't want to be carrying a lot of stuff, you know, I'm not carrying a full trauma kit on me. Um, but this will, I can handle just about anything I come across with one of these. I would love to have more gear, right? Cause I can only take care of one or two wounds with this, uh, maximum, but this, I can take care of just about anything. And one of the things, one of the main cons that I hear from people who don't, don't really know is that, well, the military doesn't approve this. It's not approved by the TCCC committee. And that's true. Um, and that's because of the way that it, it secures. So SWAT stands for stretch, wrap, and tuck. You tuck it in underneath of itself, which is very secure as long as you do it right and you know the technique. Um, but the other problem is, is that this is also not a great one to apply to yourself. It can be very difficult and cumbersome to apply this one to yourself. There's a technique for it and you can do it, but you can, you have to practice and it's awkward. And if you're already kind of bloody and a little bit um, hurt, that can make it even harder. So I want to make sure people understand that you have to learn how to use it and practice or it won't do that good for you. Um, but even though this isn't approved by the TCCC committee, um, I've talked to high level military top tier guys who are saying that they their units are running this in a cargo pocket when they're doing covert operations where they can't be wearing a bunch of big military stuff. They're not carrying a big trauma kit 
So they'll throw these into their cargo pocket and run this as their trauma kit in some of those covert operations. So even though it's not officially approved, it's still being used in the military. And I think it's a great resource extender for your trauma kit. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Like I said, you, you, uh, you've definitely single-handedly brought me around on my uh, opinion on on that tourniquet. So I'm now a a big fan. In fact, I just uh, on Monday or Tuesday, actually yesterday, I did a, a post um, on three things to to carry the, to increase your preparedness. And and the number one thing was this, right? It was like, man, you you guys, there's no excuse for every mountain biker in the world to not have one of these in their packs. They're like less than twenty bucks. And they they don't weigh very much. They don't take up any room at all. And there's really no excuse to not have one, um, especially when you consider all the things that they can do to uh, to, to to increase your preparedness. So, um, yeah, that's a great um, I mean, you know, if you take nothing else from this, just go get that right. Just go get one of these SWAT T tourniquets and practice using it. So you, you know how to use it. You know how to apply it to yourself. Um, and then uh, you're you're going to be way better prepared for for any sort of emergency situation so i want to uh real quick to uh have you speak on applying tourniquets and there, i still see this get brought up in on in some areas especially because i think in the mountain biking world like we're not thinking about emergency medical stuff and so the last thing that anybody heard uh was that putting a tourniquet on is going to cause somebody to lose that limb mm. right but if you apply a tourniquet that the, they're going to end up having to lose that limb from you cutting off the blood flow. And so people are hesitant to apply a tourniquet, especially if they're not like 100% sure that this has to use a tourniquet to uh, to stop the bleeding. And so can you just kind of speak on that a little bit? Because I know that that's been found to not be uh, the case and, and it might help ease some people's worries about having a tourniquet and applying a tourniquet. Yeah, I think uh, this is one of those um, myths just, just <clears throat> refuses to die partially because it was standard practice for the military to teach this. You know, you tourniquets were your last resort, not your first resort. That's totally changed. Now they're teaching tourniquets are your first resort. Just get it take tightened on and control that bleeding and then get them transported as quick as possible. Um, now, the risk is, is that yes, technically you might have to have a limb amputated if you apply a tourniquet, but only if that tourniquet is applied for greater than about two hours. That's the general rule of thumb. If that tourniquet is removed by a doctor within two hours, they're going to be just fine. They'll have little to no nerve or tissue damage. The longer that that tourniquet is applied past two hours, though, the greater the chance becomes for that limb to be amputated. Although they have some uh, examples of, um, I believe it was Navy SEALs coming out of Afghanistan who have had tourniquets in place for up to six hours and they were still able to save a limb. Um, but general rule of thumb is going to be about two hours. As long as you get them to the hospital within that time, they're going to be fine. What people used to have a problem with was they would think, oh, they might have that limb amputated. I'm just going to wait and see if it just stops on its own. A lot of people have died that way. So we want to make sure that we're transporting them as quickly as possible. Now we want to make sure that if you are out on the trail for greater than two hours, we want to make sure that we're not removing that tourniquet. So people, one of the <clears throat> things that they used to teach was loosen the tourniquet a little bit and let blood flow back to the leg. So that way that you have a greater chance of saving the leg. We don't do that because one of the problems that you'll have is one, you got a couple of different problems, but one, when you release that pressure on that tourniquet, there's going to be a flood of pressure down that pipe. And what's sitting at the end of that pipe is a nice clot plugging up the end of that, and you'll blow that clot right out, and then you might not get that bleeding stopped again. On top of that, they might only have a little bit of blood left to keep them alive. And by releasing that amount of blood into the gravel, now you're killing your casualty just a little more slowly. The other problem that you'll have is there is a buildup of toxins in the leg, as the blood gets trapped in the lower leg, there's gonna be a buildup of toxins. If you release that tourniquet without a doctor there ready to compensate for that, there's gonna be a flood of toxins that go into your body and will shut down your kidneys and be very, very bad for you and it could kill that, the casualty. So if you apply a tourniquet, leave it in place, 
They might have to have that limb amputated if it's past two hours, but that's preferable to them dying. So we wanna make sure if there is a worrying amount of blood, a lot of times people will ask, how much blood should there be before I apply a tourniquet? And that's really hard to gauge. On our uh, emergency trauma response course, I show how we pour out a certain amount of blood to represent how much blood has left your body. But that looks different in gravel or grass or on tile, right? So how much is too much? My rule of thumb is if I'm scared, if I'm worried, like, whoa, that's a lot of blood, tourniquet right away. Don't play around with it. Just get the bleeding controlled. If they didn't need that tourniquet, as long as they're to the hospital within two hours, no big deal. Um, standard practice right now, cops don't even look at how bad the bleeding is. They just apply a tourniquet and transport. And that's kind of standard practice for them. So totally justifiable for us to do that as civilians. Nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's good to for people to uh, to understand. So um, right on. Well, I think that uh, I was kind of looking here. It had like some other things people might think about adding to their kit. I think, you know, something like a headlamp um, is something that's good for people to, to think about if you, if you got to do any sort of work in the dark. Um, and a uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so I think that was kind of, we talked about the emergency blanket and the quick clot stuff. So those were kind of the the three things that I had uh, kind of added to my kit as well that I thought people might um, might benefit from from thinking about adding it to their kit as well. I and so some, uh, I might add some duct tape. Uh, yes, we offer flat rolled duct tape. Also, um, we have that in our tracker kit, but that's something that you can add on to this for sure. Um, that's something that's kind of hard to replicate out in the field. And you can yeah. use it for a bunch of different things. Uh, another multi-use item, um, you can tape down chest seals and that kind of stuff. Um, I also might put in an, a nasal pharyngeal airway. Those uh, pre-lubricated ones are really nice. Um, and uh, the last item I might recommend would be a rise splint. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a splint called the rise splint developed by a couple uh, by uh, a special forces medic. And it's a plastic splint that you can uh, shape so that you can take care of any fractures that's out in the field, but it packs down really, really small. Uh, at Mount Man Medical, we've been um, vacuum sealing it so it gets even smaller and more compact. Put that down into your trauma kit, and now you've got a way of handling fractures, which might be something that you're going to encounter out there on the trail as a mountain biker. Yeah, no, that's that's a good, good, uh, good thing to think of as well. In fact, I, I got my. Uh, Going back to the duct tape, one of the things that I, I mentioned that people, one of the three things is a lighter, right? So like people don't think about like carrying a lighter with them. So one, like just being able to start fire uh, could literally be the difference between life and death if you got to spend the night on the trail in a cold environment. Hypothermia, you got yep. casualties bleeding and you're you're spending the night overnight waiting for them to get up to you. Yeah, yeah. And and but to make my my lighter a little more tactical, if you will, I actually this is uh, some gorilla tape that I have, but I'll take like a one foot strip of tape and, and put it on my lighter. And then I'll also put a couple of little strips of, of road bike tube. This was a, a piece of advice that I got from somebody cause these burn really hot. And so these make super good tender. Like I, I've actually used these to start fires like huh. several times. Cause I, I have like the other, like, you know, little tender cubes and, and fire starter cubes and stuff like that. But I've always got my lighter on me. So if I'm like in the backyard, and I'm trying to start the fire pit and I'm having a little trouble. I'll just like rip one of these things off and, and throw it in there and light on fire, man. It's yet to fail me for for uh, getting a fire going and, and, and being good uh, tender. Because, again, if you, to start a fire like that's another one of those skills that I think most people I know I did. Uh, I thought it was way easier than it is. It is not easy to start a fire, people especially if you don't have some sort of like dedicated tender and you're out there trying to like get like dried grass and stuff. And then the little sticks and then the little bit bigger sticks and the little bit bigger sticks, like it can take a while and, and be a bit of a pain in the ass. But if you have a dedicated, you know, something like, 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 like a road bike tube where they have other, um, you know, things that, that act as like dedicated tender that, that burns super hot for a few minutes and they will make it starting a fire much, much easier but uh, but yeah, the duct tape is something that um, I also am, I recommend it is something people think of is 
uh, carrying on the the trail with them in an emergency because you've got duct tape and you've got a SWAT T tourniquet and you know you've got quite a few things um, covered that you can uh, can do with those things. So the uh, the last thing that I had on there was actually a whistle because uh, an emergency whistle because that was something again in talking with uh, some people who do uh, search and rescue that they're they're like man you'd be surprised how many times you know, we can figure out a general area where somebody's at, but we can't pinpoint like exactly where they're at. And so you get in an area, especially if there's trees and it's kind of tough to see. And, and they're like, you know, Hey, can you signal, can you let us know where you're at? And they have no way of doing it. You know, they're trying to like yell, but like that can, you know, especially if you've hurt a rib or your chest in some way. And so you can't yell um like having a whistle so that every time you breathe out you're you're making a loud noise that is uh distinct um is another one of those things that i think people don't think about like being able to signal for help like yes you've called for the 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 emts to come and they're in the area now how long is it going to take them to find you right versus if you had a whistle that you could just start blowing on and brought them right to you that's a great point. I didn't think about that. A lot of times I've got my cell phone. I'm like, oh, I got self-service. That's fine. You're on the side of a mountainside. You're like, where are you? I'm on the side of a mountain. Okay, where? I don't know. <laughs> that that would that would be a hard day. Very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so anyways, that was like the last little my my three things that I said was the SWAT T tourniquet, your lighter, you know, preferably kind of kitted out with some duct tape and a little bit of dedicated tender, and then an emergency whistle. And it's like, man, if you guys have that in your in your packs, like you're going to be infinitely better prepared to deal with an emergency situation um, than than riders who don't. And all those things are very inexpensive and and uh, easy to carry. Um, but, yeah, I think that, you know, getting a trauma kit like the Sweetwater trauma kit is a way to just kind of start like, you know, you need to start somewhere. So where do we kind of get that foundation for our kit going? I think that's a great one to start with. And then you can start looking at adding some other things into it um, to make it more uh, more capable. But um, yeah, that's that's a great place to start that's going to make people just way more uh, able to handle emergency situations. And so and it comes in a cool bag, too. You guys got a sweet little little pouch that it, it comes in. Um, coming out in red, too. Those are real popular. We should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Cause you know, it's the old, like, Hey, go grab the red bag over there. That's got the emergency stuff. Like black is more cool looking, but it, red is definitely more practical. Um, which again is another thing that's taken me a little time to come around on like, yeah, I'm going to get bright red and bright orange and bright shit because yeah. it like, <laughs> it, it's like, yeah, you don't want people asking like, where is it? What's the thing? Yeah. So. It's the black bag, like which black bag? Yeah. Yep. Um, Cool, man. Well, I wanted to, I, I, I'm starting to um, wrap up here on time. I don't want to keep you too long, but I wanted to, uh, I had a question last time about somebody about snake bites. Yeah. And this was something that like, to be honest with you, I hadn't really thought about, but it is definitely something to uh, consider. So I don't even know. I've, I've heard everything from, you know, like suck the poison out to like, you know, trying to put some sort of like almost like tourniquet type uh, apparatus on to stop the poison. So like I, I, you know what I mean? Like I have no idea uh, what I, what would be the actual right thing to do. So I'm actually very curious to hear from your perspective, like what, what is your advice for, for something like that? Yeah, there's a lot of different things that people say work. You know, a lot of these are things that have been handed down from a long time ago, you know, and they haven't actually ever been investigated until this current age. So we're fortunate that uh, down in some places in Mexico, I think, um, it's standard to rub dog feces on a uh, mm. on a bite, and that's supposed to help, which it doesn't, um, or at least not according <laughs> to the education I've had. Um, so right. we want to do it the right way for sure. And one of those ways that we've heard about and we've probably seen in a movie some point is like cutting a slice in between the two fang marks and then sucking out the poison. That's not a great idea. Um, because it's more of a risk of getting the wound infected and you're not actually going to be sucking out the poison uh, or the, um, the toxin. Um, so one of the things that you're gonna have is uh, not every bite is going to be a wet bite. You know, it might be a dry bite where you get bit and there's no release of venom. So 
um, that might be the case for you. So staying calm in this situation is going to be the best thing. Obviously, people are going to be freaking out a little bit. They just got bit by a snake. Am I going to die? No, probably not, right? Um, and being nice and calm is going to help you to stay calm. Uh, and it's going to prevent your heart from beating quickly and your blood from moving faster and spreading the poison and the, the venom around your body. So <clears throat> by staying calm and by not working and getting your heart rate up, that's what's going to be ideal for you. So you need to stop, sit down, and essentially just take a break um, and let your team, hopefully you've got a team around you helping you, they need to handle the situation. They need to go and get help um, or figure a way to get you down off the mountain without you getting your heart rate up so we don't spread that venom around. Um, they have a lot of snake bite kits out there. Those don't work. Um, they have little suction devices that you're supposed to be using and none of that actually works. The only real thing that you can do for somebody is to get them to a hospital that has an anti-venom. Not all hospitals carry anti-venoms. Um, and that might be a problem if you're in a very remote location, they might have to fly you someplace that actually has that. Um, but that's something that happens pretty often. So as long as you get transported quickly, you're gonna be just fine. Um, you wanna be looking for swelling where the wound is, especially if you think that you might have been bitten and you do have venom in your system, you're gonna start seeing swelling around six hours or so, four to six hours after the time of being bit. Um, but until then, we're not really gonna know. We're just gonna have to monitor the casualty and get them seen at the ER. The most important thing for snake bites is prevention, right? The most common reasons people get bit was because they're playing with the snake. You know, uh, <laughs> this happens all the time. Like, I come from the Marine Corps side, right? In the ER, we would get Marines coming in, snake bite, what are you doing? Oh, I thought it would be cool to grab a snake. I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, that's why we don't touch <laughs> snakes, right, Marine? Oh, okay, doc, you know. So don't play with them, they'll bite you. Um, that's probably your best bet. As long as you leave them alone, they'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good. I mean, would you, I, I mean, is like carrying anti-venom or like if, so if you were going into like, you knew you were going to be away, you know, like a day or more away from like real, uh, help. Um, I mean, would that be something that you would consider like, you know, carrying if you're going into like somewhere, you know, like, okay, there's a lot of rattlesnakes here or, um, you know, I, I, I don't know there. I, I, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I, I'm but, like I said, I, I know but, nothing about this. No, that's a question actually that gets asked pretty often. Uh, but the problem with that is one, the anti-venom is very expensive. The way that they produce it is very, very expensive. <clears throat> and also, um, the way that they produce it, I think they use like horse or sheep proteins or something like that, that can be potentially have an allergic reaction to. So if mm. you get it to somebody, you don't know what kind of reaction they might have. And if they're not in a hospital location, they can't monitor them in their airway appropriately. Um, so they don't issue out uh, anti-venom, as far as I know, just to anybody. You have to be a hospital. And I also think that it might be perishable. Um, so they have to keep it um, refrigerated. So mm. um, nobody really carries it out in the field. Um, I think if I was going to a location where I thought I needed it, I probably wouldn't go to that location. You know, I haven't been bit too many times by snakes. But if I was that worried about being bit, I'd probably avoid that spot personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, that, that's a good point, right? It's like the old uh, saying in pro sports, nothing good happens at the strip club at 2 a.m. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's just... Um, so, uh, so cool, man. No, that's good advice, man. That's... that's uh, like I said, like I, I had no idea. And I think that that's an area that most people ha haven't really had any, you know, real advice in that. So it's good to know, like those snake bite kits are no bueno. Um, I kind of heard that, like keeping yourself calm, because obviously the the, 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 the faster your heart is beating, the, the quicker the toxins are getting spread around. Um, and so that that makes sense. And then just, you know, trying to get off you know, get to help as quickly as possible while remaining as, as calm as possible and exerting yourself as, uh, as little as possible. So like jumping on your bike and sprinting back to the trailhead would probably not be the best, uh, the best thing, like making sure you're, you know, walking, 
um, taking it as easy as possible, stopping and resting. If you feel your heart rate starting to elevate, uh, it sounds like that would be the best uh, strategy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If um, it'll especially it'll spread faster if it hits a vein or an artery, you know, so that's why you just need to sit and chill out. There's a, you know, chill out. Hey, you might not have even gotten any venom, <clears throat> you know, this right. Might not be in an emergency. You might get all the way back to the ER and they just monitor you for <clears throat> six to 12 hours or so just to make sure that you, you're not having any problems. And if you do, then they they fix it. So keeping yourself calm is going to be ideal. Um, if you can elevate your the injury above your heart level, that'll help to reduce the spread. Not a lot, but at least a little bit. Um, and then the other thing that I usually hear is, should I tourniquet this wound to prevent the spread? Uh, and the answer is no. We, we don't want to tourniquet the wound. You'll cause more harm than good with that. Primarily, we just need to transport. Don't play around with it. Yep. Just get them to the hospital. Let a doctor look them over and double check to make sure. Takes all the stress away because they got a professional with all of the gear he needs to fix the situation. Awesome. Yeah. Well, right on, man. Well, that's that's good. Uh, great advice and something that, like I said, I don't think really uh, people are going to find anywhere else for uh, for mountain biking advice. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Uh, cool, Brian. Well, that's all I got on my list uh, of stuff. We, we covered a lot of, of great stuff and I think gave people a lot of great info and some some places to get started. Right. If nothing else, get you a SWAT T tourniquet. And, you know, you want something a little more like get your sweet water trauma kit to kind of start getting the basics. But um, and also take the course uh, practice. Right. It's like any other skill. You're going to have to practice it to, uh, to 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 be good at it. And so um, take some time, make some time. I like your advice about the, the club. Right. Like I, that actually got me thinking, like maybe approaching some of the local bike clubs and seeing if they'd be interested in having me do a, uh, a, a class or something, um, for people who'd be interested because the more people in your group who have this knowledge, the better, right? It's a force multiplier right. sort of thing. So it's like, it's great for you to have it, but if you can get one more person and they can get one more, and you know, if you've got your whole group has some sort of emergency preparedness, um, like you guys are going to be a force for good, uh, on Never the trail. Be the only one who knows the plan. Never be right. Who knows the plan? You because you if you go down, I want someone helping me out. Like I, I love helping everybody else out, but I I might need help too. Yep. No, that's that's really good advice. So, um, cool. All right. Well, anything else to uh, before we before we wrap this up? Anything else you want to want to say or leave us with? No, sir. Uh, if anybody out there is going to Shot Show, look me up. I'm gonna be out there next week in Vegas. Um, look me up on all the social medias. My YouTube channel, Mountain Man Medical um mountmanmedical.com and check out trauma kits yeah for sure and uh i think you guys can still uh if you use the coupon code bike james at checkout you will get a i think it's 10 percent or, or something like that um discount so that's i got that set up um just you know for you guys that i don't get any uh you know nothing off of that that is just because i like these guys and i wanted to give you guys an incentive to uh invest in good trauma gear and get uh get some you know get, get more riders out there prepared right because uh i think the, the, the more the better um yeah and take that course right take the course go to mountain man medical take their course and uh, at least you start your journey towards uh being having knowledge right ignorance is bliss but it's uh it can be a terrible feeling ignorance at times as well so ignorance is bliss until an emergency happens and then you're regretting everything yeah <laughs> exactly exactly so Cool. All right, Brian, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, appreciate your time. And uh, I'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. And everybody, remember, you can find me at bikejames.com. Uh, hopefully, you guys have enjoyed this podcast. And I'll talk to everybody next time. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I had a good time.